uh, I'm going to call the meeting to order. We're going to start with a moment of reflection. Thank you. Uh, at this point, you can declare a disclosure of pecuniary interest. If you have one, or actually any time through the meeting, should one arise. And then we're going to move on to confirmation of the agenda. And I have no additions or deletions, so it's as presented in your package. Motion to approve the agenda. Rhonda and Councillor Wilhelm, Deputy Warden, I guess. That's yeah, right. Councillor <laughs> Wilhelm. And that includes. Items 5.6 and the October 20th, 2022 council minutes. Does anyone want to see anything pulled for discussion? So we did the confirmation. Oh, yeah, we did the confirmation of the agenda. Sorry. Vote on the confirmation agenda. Gary, see, I'm trying to get done quicker so we can get out of here. <laughs> now we got the consent agenda items 5.1 to 5.6 and the October 20th council minutes. Motion to put that on the floor. Councilor Duncan, Councilor McKenzie. Anyone want to see anything pulled? Not seeing any hands, not seeing any on the screen. Those in favor of that motion, and that's carried. Okay. And we have no public meetings or hearings or delegations, and we're going to move into staff reports. CAO and the first up is Perth County Land Acknowledgement. And Sarah, are you taking the lead on that? Good morning, Warden Anderson and members of council. Before you is a report and recommendation regarding the use of a land acknowledgement for Perth County. Land acknowledgements are an important act towards reconciliation, and they show a recognition and respect for Indigenous, Metis, and Inuit people by honoring their land, languages, and culture. The statement as contained within the report was developed through research, consultation with experts, consultation with those who have lived experience, and an environmental scan of best practices from other organizations and municipalities. The report proposes the adoption of the statement, as well as a three-phase plan for rollout where appropriate across county programs. To assist with the rollout, I'm pleased that we have a cross departmental staff working group that includes individuals with both personal lived experience and professional experience in this space. Through their assistance, the group will work to identify opportunities where the statement could be included across the corporation, assist in developing guidelines for use, as well as developing public facing educational information. As an initial step, the statement will be used as part of the opening county council meetings, starting with the inaugural council meeting and morning selection on December 1st, 2022. The adoption and use of the land acknowledgement will further Perth County's commitment toward the values established in the diversity, equity, and anti-racism charter, as well as work toward the goals of the court strategic plan. If you have any questions at this time, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Sarah. Questions for Sarah on the land acknowledgement report. Councilor Hurley. Um, more not questions, but just some concerns. If I could raise them, I may here. We'll take this back a little bit here. Um, prior to COVID, the federal government had a rollout. I forget what bill it was, but it had to do with land acknowledgement and uh, giving powers to natives on private property it didn't fruition actually a bunch of native communities spoke out one in particular rings a bell um, and uh, they had great concerns with the treaties that are in place and again it started with land acknowledgement and it escalated into trumping in on private property rights me being who i am uh, i read this i reached out to that native band they were in the west talked with their chief they, they had great concern where it was heading. And I see this almost as a, a an arm of that. Okay, the land acknowledgement is here, but then you get into it all the phases. Let's be honest, it's rag on colonialism. It's, it's quite clear where this is going. 
I worry that it's going to become full of bureaucracy um, and some other stuff that maybe these folk don't even want. So I have my concerns. I, I really do. It's well thought here quick on the Legion active member. There's natives fought with the crown, World War II. They were very proud to fight for the crown. They talked about it. The article came out a couple of years ago. It was well done. They were honored to support the king at the time in World War II. I just want that to be made. Again, I have concerns where this is going. So I won't be supporting it. Finally, I'll, I'll finish off here with an experience I had this past summer. I went to the, it's right in line, I assure you. It only will take a minute. I went to the Amber Highland Games this year and I instantly noticed a presence of quite a few Asian folk. And I scratched my head, it, it seemed quite high. Here was the Taiwanese community of Toronto. They came to honor George Leslie McKay. A Scott, first generation, burned out of their homes in Europe, came to Zora as a young man, Holy Ghost filled him. He seen, heard that the Asian Pacific was a mess. He was a Presbyterian missionary, went over there. He instantly saw endless conflict. I'm going to finish off here. He brought such peace to that country, bringing Canadian way of living, that to this day, the Taiwanese community respects it in the highest order in Toronto and in Taiwan. Turns out a friend of mine owns the McKay farm. I didn't know it. Plus loads of Taiwanese people come out there, acknowledge him. Okay, I'm going to have to stop you. Maybe you'll stop me there, but I'm just saying, I worry where this is heading in Canadian values. Of course, folks, I get it. There was tough times. Yeah, but I'm worried where it's going. Thank you. No Any other comments or questions? Councilor McDermott. <laughs> Uh, I too will not be supporting this. It's not required. Uh, this is a federal government responsibility. You're talking about uh, every event everywhere all the time. Uh, Upper Thames does this. And after about the second time, it just becomes part of the background. It loses any kind of effect whatsoever. Um, you know, and, you know, this is kind of to make people feel good and appease people. and. I don't think that's part of my job. And uh, there are consequences to this. And one of them is uh, basically what you're saying is that the land I have isn't mine because this is a land acknowledgement. So you're acknowledging somebody else owns my land. And uh, I too understand history. I've been reading it since I was 12 years old. So I understand uh, uh, the history of here. Um, and, you know, if this is about residential schools, I understand that too. And what that proves beyond a shadow of a doubt is the fact that less government and government keeping out of your life better outcome for you. Thank you. Other comments or questions? I don't see any hands going up here. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Matt. Councilor Duncan. <laughs> Warmly or towards the end. <laughs> Thank you. Um, are we going to? Uh, is this going to be incorporated into the uh, the agenda every meeting and be read out at every meeting? Is that part of the the plan? Um, through the warden, um, I would work with legislative services to determine and establish a best practice for that. I think we would take a look at um, what other municipalities and how how they utilize it, understanding. Uh, when it and where it's appropriate for it to be incorporated, the guidelines are something that that are to come. Okay, just I guess just my suggestion: if we are going to to put this on the agenda and read it every meeting, I think we should shorten it, maybe shorten it up a little bit. That it, it's uh, not quite as long as it is now currently. Through the word, and, um, there's certainly I know through the research I have conducted, um, there's often. Um, various versions of a land acknowledgement utilized by organizations and municipalities. So uh, we can certainly explore that. Other comments? I'll make a quick one. I've been involved in a lot of meetings in the last three years, we all know. 
been with different organizations and listened to awards and all kinds of things. It seems to be just a general. It, it's a mix and match of everything. Some meetings I go to that would like it shows up on the agenda. It's never read. Uh, some it's not even on the agenda. Some it's on the agenda and it's read. Uh, it's just a combination of a lot of different factors. And I think that's something we'll come to a decision on here, you know, in the near, near, near future. This is just to bring the report forward and get this underway. Last chance for comments or questions. I have a motion. Perth County Council receives the Perth County Land Acknowledgement Report. And that council directs staff to execute the accompanying implementation plan. Moved by Councillor Kazenberg, seconded by Councillor Eight. Last chance for comments or questions. <clears throat> Those in favor. And hold your hands up for a minute. To, yeah, it's passed. Thank you. We're going to move on. Renovations or <laughs> revisions the proposed code of conduct. And that would be. That's <laughs> over here. So I'll let you take that away, Annette. All right. <clears throat> Good morning. Um, at the October 20th Council meeting, we proposed a revised Code of Conduct and Council raised some concerns. Um, there were three potential changes that were discussed. So I will ask Sean if you could please uh, pull up Section 17.1 and Section 18.1. The first change related to... Um, sorry, to sorry, sorry, sorry. That's okay. All right, so if you can scroll to the next page, Sean. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, so the first um, potential issue that was discussed related to the code of conduct and whether council could depart from the integrity commission's recommendations regarding penalties, remedial actions, um, or corrective measures. And so we've got the two sections up on the screen as they were presented. And you'll notice that in section 17.1, at the beginning, it says uh, council may impose the following. Thank you, Sean. May impose the following um, penalties. And section 18.1 says that council may, on the basis of the recommendation from the integrity commissioner, take any of the following corrective or remedial actions. So note here that the wording is may and not shall. And a review of case law, confirms that council is the ultimate authority on penalties and remedial actions. So case law confirms that the integrity commissioner investigates and determines whether there's been a contravention, but council ultimately decides on whether to impose a penalty and what penalty should be imposed. So we talked a little bit about potentially broadening this, these two sections to further confirm that council is the ultimate authority. But upon discussions with the integrity commissioner, um, staff recommend against that because if you are to broaden this section, you then run the risk of being accused of um, improperly imposing remedial or corrective actions or potentially even overreaching. So the wording is a kind of, is a balance between recognizing that council is the ultimate authority and that you do have the discretion to do something other than what the integrity commissioner has recommended. So staff does not recommend changing these two provisions. The next two issues that were uh, discussed related to the complaint protocol. So the first issue dealt with section 6.2 of the complaint protocol. And Sean, if you can scroll to the next page, perfect. Um, and in this section, there was reference to the integrity commissioner classifying a complaint within a timely manner. And council had wanted to see that timely manner defined. So what we have changed that to is, is 10 days. And that's to reflect the fact that the complainant also has 10 days to respond. But what the integrity commissioner wanted to ensure was that um, the classification could only happen after the complaint had been deemed complete. So what does that mean? What does it mean to deem it complete? Um, 
it's difficult to really give you a, a clear definition of a complete complaint, but basically what the integrity commissioners indicated that oftentimes when they receive a complaint, it's not always clear. So it may be deficient, it may require some clarification, it may be missing some information. So there has to be a little bit of a go back and forth um, so that the complaint can be clearly enunciated mm -hmm. so then it can be classified. So we've amended the wording to reflect what, what council had suggested, defining within a timely manner as 10 days. But then we've also just made sure that we're balancing that the integrity commissioner has all of the information they need to classify that complaint. So Sean, if you can go back to the complaint protocol slide number one. So what that change, how that change is reflected is, um, and if, sorry, if you can make it larger, it's very small. So yeah, the change is where Sean's uh, hand is, or sorry, the cursor is. So the integrity commissioner then has 10 days from receipt of a complete complaint. So we've changed that. And then the classification is the next, um, is the next step that happens. So they have 10 days to classify the complaint to, to indicate whether or not the complaint falls within the code, or if it's outside the code, if there's already a matter pending, or it's a conflict of interest matter. So based on the discussion that was had in council, we have edited that provision. And then, um, Sean, if you can go to the fourth slide, the next issue that came up that was discussed was the integrity commissioner's authority to abridge or extend the timeline and whether the integrity commissioner should seek counsel's approval to do that. And the integrity commissioner uh, strongly objects to this for a couple of reasons. Courts have confirmed that the integrity commissioner has independence and a broad discretion with respect to its investigation and its process. So seeking counsel approval to extend the timeline and potentially being denied that ability, um, it does undermine and impact on their discretion. And you'll recall at our last council meeting, we talked about a Supreme Court of Canada case that um, in relation to the anonymity of the complainant, that the integrity commissioner is the master of its own procedure. And as an independent third body, we as council need to respect that. It also raises an issue of procedural fairness if we, um, if we do say that the IC has to come back for approval. And what that issue looks like is what happens if the council doesn't approve the extension of time? Is a complaint dismissed? Is another integrity commissioner appointed? And would the clock then start again? Or you know, will the investigation be rushed or incomplete to force it to a conclusion? You know, and then finally, the very basic consideration that accommodations may be needed to address issues such as non-cooperation or absence of a witness or, you know, stalling techniques, medical or sorry, stalling tactics or medical or health issues. So it, it is staff's recommendation that no changes be made to this section because to do so would interfere with the integrity commissioner's authority to, term, to determine its own processes and really would um, undermine that neutral, independent, third-party role that uh, the integrity commissioner is intended to play. So subject to any questions, that is my report. And maybe, Sean, you might want to scroll back up to the complaint protocol so everyone can see it in its entirety with those revisions. OK, thank you, Annette. Questions or comments with our revised Councilor McDermott. Um, I will not be supporting this bylaw. I understand administrative law is not real law like common law. It's make up whatever you want. But by not being able to face your accuser that I cannot agree to, I cannot agree that in a democracy, a constitutional monarchy, whatever you want to call it, type of government, so that's good governments and unfortunately I read too much history and something like that is very Stalinistic toward that I find, but my comments. Any other comments or questions? Councillor Herlick? Just a quick one. Yeah, I have concerns just as I read through this, just we're all supposed to do our due diligence and they want more of it to ensure the questions are brought to staff prior to the meeting. I get that. Lots of times, though, it gets festered out in the meeting. So that's one concern I have. Just thought I'd mention it. Thank you. 
Other comment, Councilor Wright. Is there any way, and maybe I'm reading this wrong, so when, when my complaint was directed, I didn't know anything about it until the guy phoned me and said, emailed me and said, yeah, you, you didn't do anything wrong. But I never knew at all that there was a complaint filed against me. Did anybody else know? Like, is there no way that that can be? So if I'm accused of doing something wrong, there's... It's an email. It, yeah, it was an email at the end that said, Doug, you did nothing wrong. But I didn't even know that somebody had said I did something wrong. But but like for, for my complaint that was put against me, I, at the end, the guy just emailed me and said, yeah, you did nothing wrong. And I said, oh, okay. I, I didn't know there was any, I didn't know there was anything that I had done. There's no precursor to say, you've been accused of X. The process will start. Is there any way to put that in there? So through the board, what I suspect happened is under the old code, you they, they simply use your complaints to be frivolous. Yes, so they did. They step through this particular process. So it probably went from, you know, this alleged behavior, that first step on the left-hand side, yeah. straight through to the classification where they just said, we're not going to do anything with oh, this. Yeah, so I received it. We're not doing anything. That's, that's how mine was when, you, yeah. when I got the email. It's on here that just said there was no, there was no merit. No merit to the complaint that was forwarded by someone, but I didn't even know what was going on. I just thought if there was some way you knew that you thought you had done wrong, you might clean up yourself. But okay. well, I can honestly assure you, Councillor, right? That first I heard of that too. I don't. None of that information is available to any council staff. Oh yeah, like I guess it wouldn't. It just came from someone here to the integrity commissioner, and then a letter to me that said. There was no it action. Have been someone here. It was filed by someone, but it would go through our clerk's office. Right. It was filed by somebody. I don't know. Yeah. So, yeah, I didn't know. Did they tell you what it was for, at least? That you want yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. They explained it all what it was for, for sure. So just to clarify, it may have gone through the clerk's office, or it may have gone directly to the integrity commissioner. So, and it would oh. not have been made public because it was deemed frivolous. Yeah. The only person that has knowledge of it is you and the Oh, okay. But the, the board would have some knowledge of it or somebody because oh, yeah. no idea. Okay. You find out when you find out. <laughs> Just so you know. <clears throat> Other comments or questions? I have one little question. Somebody asked me this one day and I said, I honestly can't answer it. So let's say I did something or said something here today that somebody deemed a breach of the code of conduct. And they wanted to file a complaint. And I'm using just me as an example instead of someone else. How many days would that person have to file that code of conduct complaint? Is there a time limit on that? There is. So you'll actually see, um, if Sean, if you scroll up. Yeah, I couldn't read some of the fine print there. <laughs> and sorry, zoom in is what I meant. So there's a six month time period for them to file the complaint. Okay. However, if it is a conflict of interest matter, there's six weeks. Yeah, I knew there was a difference, but I could just wasn't yeah. sure. Six months. Six months for code of conduct, but if somebody says I did something that was a conflict of interest, it's six weeks. Correct. And just so everybody knows. As I honestly, when I was reading most of this stuff, there was a lot of fine print. Well, hopefully the visual, the complaint protocol, this flow chart helps to clarify what the process is so that you can see the various steps. And we will convert that into a resource if it if the um, code is approved. Oh, actually, if it gets approved, maybe you should have that on the website. And through the board, we'll use it in orientation. Not Perfect. Okay. Any other comments or questions? I have a motion. Question. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, it sounds good. Like uh, thank you. Just, just a quick comment. Um, I, I understand uh, the argument that has been made uh, both by the Integrity Commissioner and by Ms. Diamond concerning uh, the Integrity Commissioner having sort of the, the right and, and an independence uh, in their process. Um, I think the only thing that concerns me is the, the possibility remains that uh, with regards to the 90-day period that we are suggesting for the completion of any investigation, 
and giving the integrity commissioner's office the ability to extend uh, that um, there could be times where they would extend for reasons that really um, reflect uh, service commitment challenges and um, and adequate staffing and and I, I do admit to being a little unco uncomfortable with that um, in terms of ensuring that uh, when we engage with a, a contractor and in this case I would assume we could argue that the integrity commissioner is a contractor that they do have service standards in place and and that they understand that that we have an expectation around those standards so um, I, I do express mild concern there but I certainly understand that that it's not worthy at this point, uh, given uh, established precedent in, in the law, uh, to make that uh, change to the process. It, it probably would not withstand a challenge in the courts or otherwise. Thank you. Actually, Sean, if you don't mind, if you could take that off the screen there. I thought just a little weak spot up at the top and I missed them there. That's better. Uh, other comments or questions? Okay, I have a motion here. Council receives the revisions to the proposed council code of conduct and complaint protocol report. And the council repeals bylaw 3532-2016, a bylaw to establish a code of conduct for members of council of the corporation of the county of Perth, and that council adopt bylaw 3898-2022, a bylaw to establish the County of Perth Code of Conduct for members of council and local boards, including related code of conduct complaint protocol for members of council. Moved by Councillor or Kellum. Seconded by Councillor Wilhelm. This is your last chance for a kick at the cat in questions. Those in favor. That's carried. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, okay, now we're moving on. Sean, you're going to do the next one? Yes. Thank you. Uh, through you to council. Uh, good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to present a report today. Um, this is a follow-up report, the report that uh, was presented to council after the nomination period. Uh, I believe it was the first meeting in September um, about uh, Section 275 Municipal Act, which dictates that if there is going to be uh, less than 75% of the outgoing council, I'm not sorry, let me rephrase that. If, there's, if it's mathematically impossible for 75% of the outgoing council to return the new term, then certain restricted acts under Section 275 would apply. Those acts, uh, those restricted acts are listed in the report. Um, this measurement or calculation is taken at two points in election year. The first is after the nomination period ends. Um, the second is after the election day, which was October 24th. And based on the list we received from the clerks at the lower tiers, um, it is mathematically possible for eight out of 10 of the outgoing councillors to return for the new term. So the restricted acts listed under section 275 do not apply. And uh, therefore council is not in what is colloquially referred to as a lame duck position. And that is my report. If there's any questions, I'm happy to take. Thank you, Sean. Questions for Sean. <clears throat> Don't see any hands. Okay, I have a motion. Council receive, receives the restricted acts slash post election update report for information. Moved by Deputy Ward Nagat, seconded by Councillor Casper. Those in favor, and that's carried. Okay, we're gonna move on. Forestry Tree Inspectors Report, Sean Tyler. I'll take, I'll take that one. Thanks. So through the warden, good morning, Council. Uh, before you is the September 2022 uh, uh, Forestry inspectors report prepared by Marvin Smith. Uh, Marvin completed two inspections in response of submission of uh, notice of intent or NOI, one inspection in response to a complaint, and one inspection in response to a request from a landowner. The information is before you. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to pass this on to Marvin. 
questions or comments with regards to this report? Pretty straightforward. Don't see any hands. I have a motion that council receives the September 2022 forestry inspectors report for information. The Councilor McKenzie, seconded by Councilor Duncan. Those in favor, that's carried. And just before we move on from that, the first self council was very grateful to receive that report. And uh, I had several comments from the council saying that was a great report for them to see what was actually going on because there's always questions around forestry bylaw. Even at our all candidates meeting, there was somebody raised an issue. So that, that report coming out to the lower tiers is actually, I think, a good thing. I think uh, through the board and to county council, given we are embarking on a new term of council, one of the things that we would put in the early morning is for uh, Sean and Tyler to attend uh, one meeting early in the term at each of the lower tiers to go over uh, the forestry bylaw. They have a program document that's uh, very detailed in terms of uh, everything you need to know about the, the county's program and to put a face uh, uh, to the names. And um, we're happy to do that. Thank you. Moving on. Next, we have the all important draft asset management plan. Mr. Corey. Okay, try this one more time. That's good. <laughs> there it is. Oh, there we go. Morning, Corey. Good morning, Warren HC. We're ready for the uh, draft asset management plan. Seems like I pressed the button and didn't let me in. So then it finally let me in. So, well, actually, Sean had to try a couple times. Yeah. IT is a wonderful thing. So, um, okay. Uh, good morning, Warren Council. Um, you have in front of you a lengthy uh, asset management plan report that has been provided to you, to you by uh, our consultants, uh, Public Sector <laughs> Digest. Um, uh, we utilize uh, asset management software called Citywide uh, to assist us in managing our assets and Public Sector Digests are the hosts of that uh, software. Um, so in front of you in this lengthy document, um, you'll note that uh, we do have $237 million in uh, replacement cost of our total uh, portfolio of assets. Um, to note as well is that uh, uh, percentage of our assets that are in fair and better condition is about 81%. And we have used condition assessment data on 86% of our assets in total. Um, you'll see that uh, within the asset management plan that the annual requirement for our assets is about $7.9 million to ensure that we're replacing those assets in a timely manner to, to ensure our stewardship. Um, to note is as well is that we are um, allocating about $6.6 .6 million through our taxation as well as other source funding to uh, essentially replace those assets. So overall, we're at, we're at about a $1.3 million uh, infrastructure gap uh, that we have within our asset management plan. Um, this is actually really good news because uh, we are probably in a good position in, in, in relation to our overall asset management plan uh, in, in context of other municipalities that may have larger infrastructure gaps. Um, to, the plan does indicate a closure of the gap in five years, which does uh, add about 1.4% tax levy increase um, within the plan as well. 
Um, I feel that the plan needs to be extended a little more because we're still in that development stage. Uh, to note within the report, uh, we still have some other uh, key date, dates with uh, Ontario Regulation 58817 that uh, will have potential impact on the overall asset, man our asset management. Uh, one of those th items being um, the development of uh, service levels and how they may impact uh, the overall um, uh, annual requirements or, or what essentially we need to uh, set aside for uh, the replacement of assets. And then uh, as well as the next few iterations is incorporating growth uh, within the asset management plan and how that will affect it overall. Um, to the end, uh, it, this asset management plan does reflect uh, not necessarily large concerns uh, with, with our overall assets uh, and will be utilized in how we uh, present the 2023 budget uh, and, and, and the future budgets until we have the next iteration of our asset management plan. Uh, so if there's any questions uh, over on the overall asset management plan, I'll be happy to answer them. Questions for Corey? Council McDermott. Uh, no, on page 82, it uh, shows the total cost of ownership. Um, when we do the asset management, uh, the operation maintenance and disposal, day-to-day um, -day operation, is that included in uh, asset management plan? Like, are we actually, am I paying twice? I'm paying you with my taxes today to operate the road and maintain it. And then am I also putting money away in the asset management plan to operate that road and maintain it? Uh, essentially, yes, because the overall maintenance and operation of the road does uh, it affect a, a certain component of the capital component. Um, so not just a road in general, it's, it's the operation and maintenance of our um, uh, fleet as well as, as a bridges and culverts to ensure that we uh, uh, keep our conditions in a certain manner to so help to better deal with our return of investments. Uh, so those components are incorporated as the total life cycle of, of each of our assets. Councilor Willow. Uh, just a quick, quick question and a comment, I guess. Uh, a little concerned with the age of the uh, trucks, with the uh, BEF and all the after exhaust costs will uh, increase over the years. I'm pretty sure as your trucks get older. Uh, and also in their commented only tandem trucks, I, I'm assuming, would it be safe to assume that your triaxles are in there as well as listed under the tandems? Correct. Yes. Yeah, that's, that is correct. It, it, it is listed as, it identified it as tandems, but the tandems and triaxles are uh, together within that total. Um, and to further comment, uh, the this is one of the areas that is a non-core and we're looking internally as how we uh, better deal with condition of our uh, fleet. Uh, this fleet is utilizing a condition of uh, age only uh, there are other factors that can impact uh, the fleece condition overall. And that's uh, actually something we're looking into the future uh, with our asset management plan. Councilor Kasmer. Thanks, Ward Nageson. I have a number of uh, questions and, and I'm not quite sure where to go with them, but I think the first that I want to tackle is on page 27, numbered by the consultants page numbers, I believe it's, uh, and I have it up here, page uh, 104 in our um, in, in our agenda package today. And um, and I just I'm trying to understand the basis of of their estimate of uh, capital requirements of four point eight seven one million dollars, four point eight seven two I guess if you round up, um, because when you look at at what they call the trend line, which I assume is some kind of average or median or or something, um, uh, you can see that uh, as soon as we get around twenty thirty five, uh, there we've moved from a, a foothill situation to mountains, and. And, um, and those numbers look awfully concerning, uh, you know, what, 12, 15 years out. And um, and yet we're saying that the, the average uh, need or demand 
uh, on on roads at this point is four point eight seven one million dollars, and um, I'm, I'm trying to understand that because that that big surge, those mountains that start to appear around twenty two thirty five, I believe this council should be looking into that and looking to that future, and um, and yet we're saying that really the the amount that's required is four point nine for the sake of argument um so can you comment on on how they came up with this 4.9 million dollars which i'm assuming is just a five-year estimate in those foothills on that chart versus what comes after which is going to or could very well be uh, quite ugly yeah so that's the annual um kind of requirements uh within the modeling that was performed by um um, Public Sector Digest to develop this um, kind of chart. And then this chart is, is, is basically the uh, every five year gap on. So if 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 you look at the, the first 10 years, and this is the situation I think we're, with future uh, asset management plans, we have to kind of look into is is the future as you get out past 10 years starts to become like more of a, like a, a, <clears throat> I, I don't I hate to say crystal ball of, 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 in that nature because um, we have a better handle on what we what we have within the next 10 year cycle uh, but building these items in to the overall asset management plans the, is so we have that um, uh, those amounts that we are setting aside and for in, in the future is to ensure that we we have money in the reserves to make sure we're doing those assets. Because uh, you yes, it does look kind of alarming. Uh, you get the next five years, we have uh, $30 million of road work that needs to be done over a five year period. Uh, so that's close to 8 million a year uh, over that kind of time frame. I I would like to see what we would see in the next five years on how this whole overall framework um, would would come to be. But they it, it's their modeling plan on how we set up in the software on when these uh, items would become uh, end of life to be replaced for the purpose of uh, um, um, the overall uh, framework of our overall road road network. Uh, but if I might, and and I I I, you know, there's some some nuances here, obviously, because we're using models and and projections. But but you know, as you start to look to that 2035 mountain, um, wouldn't it be incumbent on councils before that to start putting uh, more money away for the sake of uh, of you know, easing what happens in 2035? Yes, correct. And, and, and within the modeling, and it can't really kind of seems like a little lower within the overall framework um, uh, for the next 10 years. Uh, but I think uh, in speaking with public works as well is that we're, we're in a plan that to, to uh, do 5 million of road work annually. Um, and this, uh, if you look at if 5 million of road work annually is, is, is there, those first two uh, uh bars should be significantly higher than the um amounts that are identified within this uh, uh graph uh so how those next 10 years would impact that uh 2035 uh bar itself so if you if you look at that so if we're doing five million annually over five years that's uh um, $25 million of, of road work. But that doesn't show as $25 million of road work for, uh, from, from the date to 2025 to 2030. I, I, I'm not sure I completely understand how that graph is to be interpreted perhaps, but um, I'm just raising that, the flag. Yeah. That it looks like there's a mountain there that emerges in 2035. And I'm not sure that the, the work that needs to be done between now and that point 
Um, it, it looks like it's projected on a five-year or 10-year basis, but that still means that in 2035, there's a portion of the asset mix that, that has to have, uh, has to be done then too, based on, on reasonable timing and, and platform, right? And so um, I, I'm a little concerned and I think that it would be incumbent on us to, to have more conversations about this um, in the life of the next council. Um, uh, one or two more things, if you don't mind, Mr. Warden. Uh, first, on page 29, um, there is a, a, a comment, perhaps somewhat wry on the part of the consultant, about how uh, there could well be um, issues um, relating to preparing uh, the data and uh, maintenance actions. Uh, certainly, it sounded to me like uh, a reference to need for more human resources to support asset management over time, and uh, I trust that, um, that this will be explored somewhat more and and that we will see in in near budgets something about that um so i'll i'll it's sort of a gentle question but i have uh, uh perhaps uh, one more point and that's on page 61 of the consultant's report there are growth forecasts uh for for perth county and um i think that um i want to be assured i suppose that um uh, the, this consultant has uh, continued to look in on the numbers that have come from uh, the planning department's work uh, from watson's uh, estimations which i think we've seen what two or three different estimations over the life of this council, given the, the surge in growth in Perth County. Um, I looked, uh, for example, at numbers in the table, uh, which showed growth and, um, you know, easily just in the next year and a half or two years, North Perth can account for 300 of the 700 that are supposed to be part of a five-year window. So I'm a little bit concerned that, that perhaps those numbers are uh, underestimates of uh, actual growth implications in Perth County and, and want to be assured that um, that will be looked at and if needed, refactored into their uh, modeling estimates. Um, sorry, I do have one more question. Uh, and this pertains to a comment, I believe, on page 69 of the consultant's report or 164 of our agenda package. And that's about this pent up investment demand of $407 million for fleet. Um, that one I'd certainly like a little bit of explanation for, um, from Mr. Bridges, if I could get that. Yeah, so the pent up uh, uh, in relation to the fleet uh, and it, um, it's one of the areas I think is 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 uh, an item that uh, within the next asset management plan we need to investigate further. Uh, um, it's a difficult uh, area if you don't um, essentially understand the total conditions of your fleet assets and just utilizing um, uh, the uh, useful life of an asset and the, the 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 set date of useful life that we have within this asset management plan. Um, could skew that pent up um, uh, uh, kind of requirement for the purpose of uh, for of the of, of the total fleet, um, and it's one of the areas I, I believe is is uh, that us as a county need to investigate uh, uh, further to ensure that um, the overall fleet that we are uh, putting on the roads is ensuring that uh, we can do. Uh, and performance services that we have uh, it, it, within the uh, uh, our gambit of services that we provide to the citizens. So um, uh, we were noting that that seems that the fleet costs are escalating significantly uh, versus our set um, rates that we have to generate uh, money to be put into reserves. Uh, and it's one of those areas that I brought back to council is the uh, is that we are hindered when we have a light winter because we utilize a uh, internal job or uh, equipment rate that that doesn't necessarily generate when you don't have uh, the vehicles on the roads itself. So it, it is one of those areas that uh, uh, county is is looking at, um, uh, and they're actually we're looking at currently with uh, with uh, the internal staff that we have. Other questions, Council McDermott. Oh, just a quick question: If we raised, if today we raised the uh, tax rate one percent, what does that bring in 
Like how much taxes would we get if we raised them 1%? 1% levy increase is about $180,000. Oh, okay. Thank you. Councilor Hurley? No, great report. Um, it's always interesting, these reports, Corey, and the consultants we hire, you deliver well. I, I, I really admired that the last four years. Asset management is something I respect. Yet that being said, the world runs on borrowed money and we as a council need to remember that. The idea that we need to have enough money to replace all the roads, that's being a little exaggeration. But folks, if the money's there, people know they can harvest it. So yes, we have a duty to ensure there's funds and a surplus, but how much, that, that gets tricky. So everything just keeps jacking. So interesting report, well done, thank you. Other comments or questions? So I got a couple of comments or questions. i have allowed to, I guess. On your first chart, percentage of assets with assessed condition data. I thought all assets had to be in the asset management plan. So could you give me an example that's in that 14% that doesn't have assessed data? Uh, fleet is the one of the major items that we have that uh, not necessarily have condition data for the purpose of uh, 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 the um, to determine what condition a, a, a vehicle is in and not just utilizing a um, useful life as a determination of the condition, uh, meaning if it's 10 years old, uh, condition is poor. Um, the, this asset management plan does uh, require to have our core <laughs> assets, meaning our roads, bridges, uh, to be utilizing condition as a uh, as an item for um, uh, performance. And those are the ones that we have that are uh, utilizing the condition data. Facilities is another area that uh, not necessarily 100%, uh, but we do have a relatively new, uh, uh, not old, but uh, condition facility index that we had done, uh, but it looks to be in the future that those, those condition assessments need to be done on a periodic basis for the purpose of uh, asset management. John, do you have a comment? Through, through the warden, maybe I can just expand on that a bit. Uh, uh, like Corey's right, like a number of years ago, uh, one iteration of our asset management plan, our facilities were age-based. Uh, so we did a facility condition index or a facility condition assessment and then it provides uh, a, what's called an FCI on different components of those facilities, which can be better managed through the asset management plan. Um, it's always best to have a condition index to, to manage these, these assets. Uh, as he said, fleet is still based on age. There is work uh, in, in the municipal sector that is being done on looking at uh, sort of fleet condition indexing and things like that so that we can better manage those assets moving forward. And we're, we're actively looking at that uh, with, with other municipalities. Okay, second comment. I went through the state of infra infrastructure summary and seen all the percentages of our equipment as an average condition. I understand why the fleet would show up at 38%. If we've got older vehicles, further to Councilor Wilhelm's comments. Uh, machinery and equipment, we were at 64. But the one that kind of threw me off a little bit, the bridges and culverts were 69, road was 64. I can see those numbers reasonably. And I'm looking at facilities at 63%. And that's the one that kind of made me question that number. Because in my term on county council, we have a lot of new facilities. And we're sitting in one, we've got the archives, we've got some new EMS bases, uh, we've got a bunch of new public works buildings for whatever reason, fire and different things that have happened. And I'm thinking, my, that seems just a titch low to me. So is that based on depreciation more than anything as a factor to come to that rate? 
Mr. Warden, um, it does look to be that uh, the furniture component of the overall uh, percentage is pulling that uh, percentage down. But you're right, uh, 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 with having um, ambulance stations and having one of our ambulance stations relatively significantly new and office uh, space, um, meaning um, that is should be a little bit uh, aged uh, as a uh, facility that we are currently in in the county courthouse, um, that those percentages, um, but we are still looking at a facility condition assessment that was done in 18, and, and now we are utilizing those conditions, and now it's de uh, depreciating those conditions to come up to a, a 2021, 2022 uh, percentage. Okay, and then just one other comment. Councilor Kassenberg had asked questions about further down the road to need more for this and that. So I know I had access to some reports in the last little while. And because like you think your fleet demand's high now, and fleet would be part of our EMS base. Uh, because of the aging population, the number of calls is increasing dramatically. And I do mean dramatically every year. We are going to need more ambulances. We are going to need more staff. We're going to need a bunch of things in order to maintain that. And hopefully we're gonna have space to drop them off someplace. But, you know, these numbers are good, but these numbers will also change a bit based on what happens down the road here. We've seen how much things have changed through COVID. It's a great start. I understand that. But some of these things are gonna have some variations to them in my mind. Councilor Hurley. A last quick comment. Well, well executed there, Warden. Uh, catching them percentages on the buildings. I myself wasn't aware of the amount of newer buildings we have. I knew there was a few, but yeah, a little more experience by yourself. I said it before, and I'm going to say it again. It's real. Warden just talked on it. The aging population, man, oh man, it's going to get expensive. So all us sitting here in this county, take that back to your township when the community's in wanting everything. Make sure you let them know there's expenses coming and we're going to have to cover it. We're going to be flipping that buck and it's going to get big. You're dang right it is. And we have to do it. So watch where you're spending money and think you need and what you need is going to be more important than ever. Good report. Um, I can make a comment. I think we're good. Anyway, I have a motion here. If no one else has any questions or comments. With the motion on the floor, and I guess you can still add one. County Council receives the 2022 draft asset management plan report, and that County Council approved the 2022 draft asset management plan. Move by Councillor Wilhelm, second by Councillor McDermott. Last chance for questions. Those in favor, not the carrier. Thanks, Corey. Welcome, Warden. And we're going to move on to the Regional Government Enterprise Agreement with Erie. Esri. Esri. Yeah. I don't see a Z. Oh, there's an S. I guess we'll call that Z. But Esri Canada. And that is uh, Steve Drake. And there's Steve on the screen. Perfect. Morning, Steve. Good morning, Warden. We're ready for the report. Okay, good morning, Council. So this report is to advise Council on the Regional Government Enterprise Agreement with uh, Esri Canada for the licensing of the county's core GIS software. So in 2006, a GIS needs study involving the county and member municipalities concluded that a centralized enterprise GIS platform should be developed to better serve the county and the member municipalities to help maximize benefits and reduce costs for all the parties. Since then, Esri software has been used as the core technology to develop and host the county's enterprise GIS platform. Today, that platform provides data and applications critical to the delivery of core services from the county and member municipalities. Some examples of where Esri software is used for GIS services by county and member municipal, municipal staff include online building permit applications and inspections, 
road and sidewalk inspections and maintenance, planning and development applications, official plan consultations and management, snow plow and transit route development, municipal asset management programs, land parcel information management, risk and response information included in the community emergency management program, and municipal addressing programs, including 911 updates and road and parcel signage. Esri is the largest supplier of GIS software in North America today and offers a comprehensive line of interconnecting multi-platform tools, including server, desktop, cloud, and mobile GIS software, all currently used by the county in its GIS program. Staff have concluded, concluded that no other vendor in the market can provide the same software service offerings that meet the scale and complexity required by the county and member municipalities in an enterprise GIS platform. Esri Canada is the exclusive distributor and sole source of Esri software and related products in Canada. Its software can be licensed either as a standalone component or under a regional government enterprise agreement. The county currently licenses its Esri software as standalone components where individual licenses of various software are purchased separately and subject to annual variable market price increases. The Regional Government Enterprise Agreement allows the county to sign a three-year agreement granting unlimited access to core ESRI software at a fixed annual fee. This would provide for a lower cost per unit to the county and allow us to increase our use of core ESRI software at any time without seeing additional costs. It also provides an enhanced level of access to ArcGIS online services to sustain growth in the GIS program for both county and member municipalities for the long-term foreseeable future and includes unlimited access to ESRI technology support, online ESRI training, and discounted online instructor-led ESRI training. In addition, the Regional Government Enterprise Agreement, although signed and financed by the county, could extend all of those same benefits to the member municipalities if they choose. The recently completed IT and GIS strategic plan reported that there was a significant opportunity to grow the GIS service and also recommended that the county switch to a regional government enterprise agreement for the licensing of the software used to build and run the enterprise GIS platform. When we consider the growth in demand for GIS services and forecast the required upgrades and purchase of new software licenses we'll need in order to meet that demand, the Regional Government Enterprise Agreement provides us the best value licensing program with an estimated cost savings of over $69,000 through the three years of the agreement. The cost of the agreement is based on population served, which includes all four member municipalities, placing us in level two of the program for populations between 25,001 and 50,000. The cost of the first year of the agreement is reflected in the 2023 Technology Services Operating Budget, with subsequent years included in future forecasts. That concludes my report. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to try and answer them. Thanks, Steve. Questions for Steve on his report. Councilor uh, Wilhelm. On your uh, comparison uh, without uh, our GEA and with our GEA, uh, in your first one in 2023 includes one-time upgrades to server, desktop, and extension licenses. I take it with the other one, you don't need the uh, upgrades for the computers, et cetera? Correct. They, those would all be included as part of the agreement. Other questions? Comments? Oh, Lauren? Yes, just through the warden to council, this is a really good step forward to be able to expand our program to support the lower tiers. We've had excellent feedback from the local municipalities. And I think uh, uh, what I recall hearing is this is fantastic. And um, they, they have um, uh, very much um, welcomed this sort of a change. So it's a savings, it's an increase in our service and it's a savings. So it's, we're very pleased with this. It also advances the strategic plan. Perfect. And we all know we need to keep working on their IT and EIS because we do have a new person that's just started, just met this morning. Because that is going to be your future, whether you like it or not. 
Okay, I have a motion. Council receives a report titled Regional Government Enterprise Agreement with Esri Canada. Moved by Councillor Duncan, seconded by Councillor McDermott. Last chance for questions. Those in favor? That's carried. We're moving on. And next, we're going to Mr. McCollum Facilities Project Update. Thank you, Warden Nacherson. Good morning, Council. Just a quick update here on a couple of our uh, facility projects this year. Paramedic Services HQ roof repairs. Uh, they were completed in October 20 of 2022 uh, and included uh, damage areas to the flat roof that is directly above our heads today. Um, work included removal of areas of damaged membrane and insulation. And as well, we applied a UV reflective coating over the entire surface of the flat roof. That coating is hoping to uh, and designed to extend the serv ser serviceable life of the roof and mitigate further surface deterioration. We had approved the contract at a, just over 100,000 plus HST. That amount did include a $10,000 contingency allowance. However, we didn't find any further damage and no addition was required, resulting in a final cost of just over $90,000 plus HST. The courthouse elevator project, we've kind of reached a, a key milestone or in, within that project and we finally got the underpinning complete. And that was a little difficult in getting, in getting done because uh, we've had a number of superior court sittings uh, in the fall here. And, and when that's in session, the contractor is not able to perform work. Um, Come Monday, November 7th, we, uh, we have three weeks where there's no superior court and we expect some significant action within the courthouse and that will be the construction of the concrete block elevator shaft. Our current schedule is still indicating that the elevator itself will be installed beginning in January of 2023 and project completion in March of next year. The five here on Reno and connecting link addition. Uh, this is just an update because uh, next week we are still planning a special council meeting to deal with the project design, bring you an updated cost estimate for that project. Um, of course, the original budget was approved at 2.1 million and was based on an estimate for renovation and construction of the building envelope. Uh, since then, there's been a number of design changes and considerations that have, uh, have been incorporated into the design. And we've mentioned a few things along the way, but just to, to bring you up to speed, uh, we've had certainly some material costs which have escalated since the original cost estimate of over a year ago. Uh, exterior site work has greatly expanded, and that's just to manage some of the stormwater drainage and drainage of the site, and also manage access and egress of the buildings. And of course, when we did uh, elevations and design of, of floors and things, we have different ele floor elevations between Five Huron and the courthouse. And we sort of have to link that uh, with the connecting link addition and, and handle that through the design. We have an expanded square footage of the connecting link addition of approximately 300 to 400 square feet. And this was done so that we better accommodate the elevator and the second set of egress stairs to the lower level of five Huron. The design and layout of the connecting link has changed to provide more layers of security. So over the last few months, uh, we've had a few issues that we've been dealing with and council has sort of given direction here that we need to take a bit of a lens of security in, in the design of this project. So we've certainly done that, taken that back to the consultant and uh, the connecting link is now focused more on, a, on security and providing layers of security for both buildings. And I think you'll see that in, in the final design. Redesign was required to accommodate some existing utilities. Uh, otherwise, it would be too costly to, to relocate these. 
We also included in the design resurfacing and the addition of a sidewalk or walkway along the front of the parking lot. Um, this is something that we want to make sure we include in the design for drainage and everything like that, and that can be incorporated. However, this is a stage of, and a piece of the project that was, wasn't budgeted earlier and could be done as a final stage or an additional project later on. Uh, we, and just to note that we did have, we do have to replace uh, the six current units on five here on that was planned for 2024, 2025. Uh, that budget was to be incorporated, obviously, those six units only only heated and cooled the uh, main floor of five here on uh, the lower level was is just heated by unit heaters down there so the new system has to be all designed to to heat and cool both both levels uh, so those budget dollars that we had set aside for that replacement would be uh, redirected into this project and as well noted uh, before the need for a new generator. The generator at the courthouse is currently undersized and there is no generator for backup power at five here on. So we do have um, a, a review in place here that is currently being done to look at the potential of one generator to power both buildings and or a, a separate generator for each building. And that will be upcoming. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions for John. Councilor Hurley. The utilities there, John, uh, through you, Warden, at, at the new building that we're doing the mass renovation, the hydro, where does it come from? I remember the archives, there was connection. I'm just trying to put this all together. It is 100% separate, the five here on, or the, the existing uh, license office. It's separate. Through, through the warden, correct, the, the electrical is separate. It's not fed from the courthouse, if that's what you're asking. Could get quite complex, <laughs> running one generator. But yeah, no, thanks. Other questions? Yes, we'll be dealing with this more in depth a week from today. Just an update at this point. <laughs> No other questions or comments. I have a motion. The county council receives the facilities project update report. Councilor Wilhelm. Move seconded by Deputy Lord Negates. Those in favor? Carried. Okay, moving on. Council reports. Anybody have anything under council reports? <laughs> I got one little thing to bring up. It is the time for all the swearing in of new council, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I've had a request from the city of Stratford for a representative to attend their swearing in on November the 17th. I am unavailable for that. I have checked with the deputy warden. She is unavailable for that. It would be nice to send a representative to the city of Stratford for their inaugural council meeting. And do we have a volunteer? You don't see a lot of hands going on. Seventeenth, seventeenth. So it's a third Thursday. They are tied up. There's so many things on that it's it's kind of a struggle. Like Rod and I each had like three things we could do that night. What is the what is the hour of the day, uh, Mr. Warden? Uh, I believe it's in the evening. Uh, we I can check that out. I'll get my laptop fired up here and I'll answer that question for you in a bit. How's that? Would you be interested if you're available? I I could do yes. Okay, so we're gonna leave it at that for now. I'll get the invite opened up here shortly, but we're gonna move on to other business. We're not gonna stop and wait for me. Okay, and that uh, council reports. And bylaws, we have bylaw number 38982022 be in the code of conduct slash bylaw. And that uh, is to be read a first, second, and third time 
and finally pass this third day of November, 2022. Moved by Councillor Kassenberg, seconded by Councillor Eight. Those in favor? And that's carried. And notice of motions. I don't believe we have any. Okay, so we're moving on to other business. December 1st council meeting discussion. So I will, I'm not sure who's leading that. Lori, you leading that? Ron, are you leading that? Well, I asked for it, so I don't know if I can go first. Um, the warden's uh, election got moved from November 17th to December the 1st. Uh, it's come to our attention that on November 30th, there's an economic development um, support, um, thing in Toronto that we can go to, the mayors and the economic development team and our CAOs. And so to get back in time, we can stay overnight. And to get back in time for December 1st meeting is going to be really tough. I think economic development is very important. It's a great opportunity for us to meet with some of the MPPs and uh, also the premier that night. Um, so I'm asking that, uh, oh, just back in up a bit, our economic development team just won an award and congratulations to them, uh, Discover More Adventure. This was an innovative category and you know, it's a, to me, it's a real honor. If we don't have economic development, we need it for growth. And I think growth is very important in, in our municipality. So I'm just wondering if council would entertain changing the time of the warden election instead of having it at nine o'clock in the morning, if possibly it could be at one o'clock. It can be the same day or it can even be that night. But I'm not sure where um, Walter or Todd, what they're thinking. I, Jim and I have had a conversation uh, about what he's going to do. And I would certainly like to go. I was there four years ago. And I know it's not a big event, but it's a very, to me, it's a very worthwhile event to, to attend to. So I'm just wondering what- for by eight o'clock, isn't it? It's over at eight o'clock? Well, it is, but do I want to drive to Toronto at, to be there? And um, I've heard that they're looking into all of us going out for, for supper that night too, as a group. And City of Stratford and maybe, I don't know, St. Mary's will be there too. So it's uh, more than just, yeah, go, going there and have it in and then, and if it's foggy like this right now, I'll tell you that I will not be coming back that night <laughs> or even first thing in the morning. So it could impede some of us. Maybe it, it doesn't others, but to me, it's an awful lot to drive to Toronto, attend the function and drive home and then get up the next morning and be bright and alert for County Council. So. Uh, thank you, Mr. Warden. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry. No worries. Um, uh, I'm, I'm with um, a Deputy Warden Agates completely on this one. I um, have not attended, had not had the opportunity to attend an event like this in Toronto uh, with uh, the esteemed audience that's projected and for the purpose intended. Um, would like to go, um, but uh, certainly I show exactly the same concerns. And of course, if there's a, a snowstorm or something uh, that could make uh, for treacherous travel returning home that evening and lead to absence from County Council the next morning. So um, I, I would um, invite colleagues at this table to consider uh, a change in time on the first of that meeting. Councilor McCormick, um, I'd be quite in favor of that. And if you need a motion, I certainly I will make a motion. We'll move there eventually. But uh, other comments? Well, the first question to me is: Can we change the date now? No. It's virtually impossible to change that's things while everybody's there. It to the Friday, but that's not no. Because right okay. then there's other things going on on the Friday. It's an extremely, extremely busy month for a lot of us. <laughs> I'd be in favor of moving it back to one o'clock if that would suit everybody. Okay, I got a question. So, will the inaugural meeting and I guess, do we have to check with the art and park to see if that space is even available at one o'clock? 
Uh, through the warden, I think we can accommodate that. I know we have the Arden Park available, and uh, I don't think that would be an issue. So the clock would suit us just fine if that's council's will. We'd be happy yeah. to do that. Okay, so it sounds like people are agreeing for December the 1st still, but one o'clock at the Arden Park. Any difficulty then, Venus, we're moving the time? Like, I know if we move the date, it's got to be, uh, you've got to tell people 30 days ahead of time or something. So, if well, it's not just that, you've already time. told people that's the date because there's other past wardens, etc. Yes, through the warden, it's not 30 days, it's just the, uh, for a regular council meeting, we actually we only need 48 hours for that. Oh, but okay. there's, there's a lot of people involved in this one because we do have the past wardens coming in. Yep. And, no, no uh, it's just that you don't have to give, uh, you're, you're not required to give uh, the time days. ahead. You can change the time. 48 hours. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's fine. Yeah. So we're happy to make those changes. If there is a problem with the Arden Park, we'll just find another location. We'll make sure that we communicate it to everyone involved. Downey Optimist Community Center. Thank you, though. We could do that. So something accessible. So do that. No, do we need, we'll need a motion though to act yeah. into the date because it's already on our okay. schedule. Yes, yes. So I need a motion now to change the date on December 1st from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Moved by Councillor McDermott, second by Council Deputy Ward Nagas. Those in favor? That's scary. I'm just personally saying, oh, like I'm personally not going to attend that. I got way too many stuff. Many things on. I've been there. It's, it's good. It's good to be Um you be interested to see what the atmosphere is like uh, with everything going on at the provincial government right now. Mm -hmm. I guess is the word I'll use. What's that? Walk by the pickets. <laughs> yeah, you could have trouble getting in. Anyway, we're going to move on. So that's been changed. Uh, uh, Deputy Warden, election nominations. So this is the time when everybody has their chance to put their name forward. And I'm going to start over on this side of the table and just go around. So, Walter. Well, <clears throat> after a considerable amount of time thinking this over, I'm certainly not going to run for warden. <laughs> um, I guess it's just an opportunity to thank Jim for the leadership that he's shown over the last three years. So certainly, it's been a challenge, I'm sure. Um, I also would just like to comment, I guess, on, on the tremendous staff that we have here. And, and we've seen a complete, almost a, a teardown of, of what's happened in some of the departments and we're building it back up. And, and I, I really appreciate the staff that we have here and what they're doing. I don't think we, we give them credit often enough. So here's my opportunity. Kudos, way to go. Thank you. Yeah, you're allowed to say a few words, everyone. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, you're Councillor Kellen. Very well said, Councilor McKenzie, and I echo all of his comments, and for that I will not be running for the board. Thank you. Councilor McDermott. Uh, I echo the uh, Councilor's uh, uh, words also, but uh, I will not be running for the board. Councilor Kazenberg. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Warden, and uh, I too am grateful for uh, your service over the last three years. Um, I'm pleased to indicate that I would be honored to serve as warden and will allow my name to stand for that purpose. Okay, uh, Councillor Duncan. Yeah, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank you, Jim, as well for your, for your service as warden. I'm sure through COVID, it's been quite a challenge. And I'd also like to thank our staff. And no, I will not be letting my name stand for warden. Deputy Ward Nagas. I too wish to thank staff for all they've done. It's great to work with all of you and, and go through everything. And, and also thanks to Jim for his uh, last three years. He's been a very, very busy man. When I call him, I say, how are you today? Lovely, he says. <laughs> <laughs> so I know, he's, I know he's had an awful lot on his plate. Um, I'm not ready yet to say yes or no. If I want to, to uh, run, I still have some contemplating to do and some things to figure out. And uh, yeah, I know it would be a super busy time. I'm busy with being the mayor, 
do I want to take on the extra? You know, I've got grandkids and I still farm full time with my husband. And yeah, I got an awful lot in my plate. So if it's uh, okay with everyone, I'm not going to announce just quite yet. So I can do it right right up to that date. Is you that can do it on the day? On the day? Yes. Okay. Yep. All right. Thank you. Okay. Then Councilor Well, I might ask you, but I'm pretty sure you're. I'm not going to be coming back to county council, but I'm going to say a few words. Well, thank you, and uh, you're absolutely right. I think I am the only one in this room that volunteered not to come back, and uh, I certainly appreciate your uh, efforts and your hard work, uh, Warden Aitchison, and uh, I can assure you, Deputy Warden, that his days have not all been lovely. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know that. <laughs> so, in communications, and uh, it's been a privilege to serve on county council. And as the warden, I had the opportunity, which I certainly was pleased with. And uh, as one of the senior members here, as Walter has indicated, we've seen a, a big change in staff. And I must admit, it's for the better. Uh, there was certainly some questions over the time whether uh, it was the right move, but I think it's proven out that uh, change is not always bad. And I congratulate all staff on uh, moving uh, morale and everything forward and uh, making a more professional uh, organization than we've ever had. And uh, I certainly enjoyed working with them and I appreciated all their support. And thank you. Thanks, Councilor Wilhelm. So, yeah, I guess it's up to me now. <laughs> so, I've already told you I have no intention of seeking the warden's position again. Would I like to do it? Sure. I, I'm going to say I thoroughly enjoyed it, but that could be a bit of a stretch. <laughs> it has had its share of moments in the last three years with COVID. I'm not going to lie. And yeah, I always answer the phone with sort of a positive. <laughs> Response because if you're negative, that I don't like people who are negative, so that's what I always say. How are you today? Fine, lovely. It has really taken a ton of time this last few years, meetings that I ever, never, never dreamt I'd be involved in when I took this job on. My focus when I took this job on was to, I'm going to be honest, you know, I'm pretty honest and upfront. I want to see some changes made so it became a better culture and a better operating organization. And I think we have come a tremendous, tremendous way. Unfortunately, not everybody got to see that in the beginning because you weren't here. I was, and we, we've got a completely different mindset at the county. Like if I walk in now and I say to somebody, gee, you know, one time I'm gonna, spend, you know, I'm not knocking people when I say this, but four or five years ago, they'd almost look at you and run the other way so they didn't have to talk to you. Now I say, what can I do for you today? That's the difference. And if I phone up directors or staff members and say, I need a favor, it's instant. It's done. So that's the difference I see. And, and I have enjoyed immensely all of our new staff. We have hired some great staff. And I can't go down through the list and name them all because but we've got a bunch of new directors. We've got Mike Adair from Edeby with our EMS, and that's probably been one of the best things we've ever done. You know, we made Lori full time. We hired Annette to be our director of corporate services. Uh, we've had a little glitch, maybe in POA, but we're coming again. Our planning department has basically changed it. And yes, we've still got a few little growing pains there, but they. That department took over a bad situation and it's getting better by the day, but I see how busy they are. So sometimes I'm looking for answers and I just kind of don't really bother them because I know they're swamped and run off their feet. If you see the applications they got in all the time. But no, it's it's been a great three years. And, uh, you know, we got great clerk here. Whoever wants some well has to keep me in line. <laughs> But uh, no, I've enjoyed working with y'all. I am coming back as the mayor of Perso, so you're not done with me yet. <laughs> I just need a year or two to maybe regenerate the system because <laughs> it has been a tiring three years. I am not going to say it hasn't been. 
but enjoyable. Met a lot of great people. And some of the great people I've met when the election time rolled around this year, their comment to me was, you're going to do that again. They threw me in the towel. They said they'd had enough. And I can go down through some people that are very, like George Bridge and Allison Warwick and Stevie Arnold at Atlanta County. Like they just said, yeah, we've had enough. We're done. It is a challenging position, not only as a warden, but even as a counselor or a mayor. It's, it's every position has its challenges, trust me. But you either have the passion or you don't. I still haven't lost the passion. Just lost the energy for a while. But I'll be here. Anyway, that carries that on. So we have one confirmed and one possible. And oh, yes, and I truly do want to thank all the staff. Truly, truly, truly. In every department. I know John and I had some great conversations, Bill Wilson, IT. I keep telling IT, you're one of our most important parts. We got to get more people there. We got to get this rolling, and we've got one there, and it's coming. Like everything's coming, but you, you know, Rome wasn't built today, so we just have to keep building more blocks. <clears throat> and that's good for me. Right. And so, through the warden, I just want to say on behalf of the staff and myself, a great appreciation for council and the accomplishments that you've achieved over the last four years during your term. Um, as everyone has said, we've come a long way. Um, I've seen the changes, haven't been here, you know, as long as, as some members have been, but definitely have seen the changes. And I'm very proud to work with the staff that we have as well as county. It is a privilege to sit in this position and our positions in our local government organizations are privileged. And so it is our, our great um, our great privilege to work with the elected officials uh, carrying your direction and seeing it come to fruition. So thank you again. Thank you. So one more little thing to do before we move on. Does anybody want to declare their intent for deputy work? And we'll start here and go around again. <laughs> And we will have some new counselors mm -hmm. coming back. Mm -hmm. That position is still available. And maybe one of them may even want to run for warden. We'll see. Uh, Nothing. Nope. Not this year. Not this year. You? Probably not. <clears throat> ah. Not this year as well. <laughs> Ron will decide on you later. Okay. Let's move on. Any other announcements? Councillor Kennedy. Yes, I would just like uh, to invite everybody to our official opening of our new administration building tonight. I hope everybody could maybe make it. Uh, hours are from five till seven with a ribbon cutting at, I believe it's six o'clock. Um, certainly very proud to show off our new facility to everybody. And I would also extend uh, an invitation uh, I know we're starting to get a little fuller in here all the time. So if you ever want to make use of our facilities for a county meeting, by all means, uh, you'd be more than welcome. Um, an opportunity. Yeah, sometimes we can expand that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that's the new warden's problem, not mine. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so if uh, you've got a few minutes tonight, by all means, come on up and have a, have a tour. Well, Walter, I'd love to come up. I'm I've got four things on to me. Oh, one more. Let's stay. You only have the big drifting board in there. Now I got to blame some strap or something. Too, so I'm gonna do all... Somehow I still have some livestock to feed before I run through meetings to go to the further functions. So can't pick to have it, eh, Warden? No, no. no. Gentleman's way of quitting farming. I applaud you. Uh, well, I wish it was a gentleman, but I. <laughs> well, I have a son who farms and I thoroughly enjoy helping him because I still can. That's right. And there's got to have a reason to get out of bed in the morning. Some mornings I have to get up too early. I may not miss that as much because I'll get up this morning. I'll be up at six, make sure everything's done something here in good time to make sure everything's in place and ready to go. And I'll have an extra 15, 20 minutes to snooze. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, 
Okay. We do have three counselors that we know are not coming back. So on behalf of the county council and myself as the warden and staff, we just want to make a little presentation to them and thank them for the years of service and everything that they've done for the county of Kirk. And I'm going to start with Councillor Doug. Hey, I can walk to you, Jim. You did a lot more work today than I did. <laughs> there you go. My boy makes me work at night, not in the morning. We'll get pictures out. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, well, my son's got lots to do in the morning, so I, I end up doing all the beef battle tours. Okay, and next we're going to move on to same comments. Councilor Herbert. I want to thank you for your service. And uh, just a little token of our appreciation. Great. Thank you. And we have one more, last but not least. President Mayor Purcell, last word, uh, who chose to maybe go with an easier lifestyle, but still had the passion. <laughs> no, sir, will <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Jim, and uh, I'll still be able to harass him for so. Oh, I <laughs> and I'll still be able to do it the other way around, trust me. <laughs> okay, moving on. Next, full session. And I need a motion to go into closed session at 10.37. In accordance with Section 239 of the Municipal Act, Section 2025 is amended to be considered A, a matter pertaining to labor relations, B, a matter pertaining to litigation, and C, a matter pertaining to security of property emergency management. Moved by Councillor McKenzie, second to Councillor McDermott. Those in favor? Carry. And we'll need about five minutes probably to do everything. Okay, I have confirmatory of bylaw 3902-2022 be the bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the Council of the Corporation of the County of Perth at a regular meeting held November 3rd, 2022 is ready. First, second, and third time, and finally passed November 3rd, 2022 by Council McDermott, second by Council Duncan. Those in favor? It's carried. Motion to close the meeting at approximately 12.11. Councilor Casberg had his hand up before I didn't get it, and Councilor McDermott. Those in favor, it's carried. Thank you very much. <laughs>